Um, please bring on the, the first line. Um, yeah, like, um, why are we waiting for the first slide? Um, it's, um, it's basically what I believe that, the, that architects should be uh, designing, like rather than sort of designing uh, two-dimensional uh, facades or, or three-dimensional architectural objects, uh, we architects should become sort of uh, designers of ecosystems. So not, so not only sort of designing the flow of people through our cities and buildings, but actually the flow of resources uh, so that it becomes sort of systems of both economy and, uh, and ecology. Um, you can say, um, uh, why, why this sort of a change in role is like, a, if you look at this image, this is, this was taken at the, at the COP15, the Copenhagen uh, Conference on Climate Change, a bit more than a year ago. Uh, and as you can see from the photo, it, uh, it wasn't exactly a party. Uh, I, I think sort of uh, Sarkozy, Brown, Merkel, even Obama. Uh, because it was actually a, a big disappointment. Because the whole discussion about sustainability was actually drowning in this sort of uh, understanding that sustainability is a question of how much of our existing quality of life are we prepared to sacrifice in order to afford being sustainable? So essentially this sort of good old Protestant idea that it has to hurt in order to do good. Um, and, and if everybody thinks that you know, um, sustainable life is less fun than normal life, it becomes a very sort of uncompetitive uh, point of view for sustainability. So uh, when we were asked to design uh, the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo, uh, where the subject was sustainable cities, we thought, right, what about another kind of sustainability? What about a, a sustainability that actually increases the quality of life, you know, where sustainable cities and buildings make life more fun? <clears throat> we also tried to ask ourselves, what, what could Denmark teach the Chinese that would be relevant to them? Uh, you know, one of the biggest countries in the world and one of the smallest. Uh, China, symbolized by the great dragon. In Denmark, we have a national bird. Um, and, uh, and China has many great poets. But in the sort of Chinese public school curriculum, we discover that they have fairy tales by Antushung, or Hans Christian Andersen, as we call him, which basically means that all 1.3 billion Chinese grew up with the story of the Little Mermaid. Uh, it's almost like a fragment of Danish culture that has been embedded into Chinese culture. Um, uh, the biggest tourist attraction in China is the Great Wall, uh, reportedly visible from outer space. Uh, in Denmark, uh, it's the Little Mermaid. <clears throat> that's like hardly even visible from the canal to us. So, um, so there's these obvious differences. Both, both Shanghai and Copenhagen are port cities, but they're, you know, completely different scales and sort of urban attributes. But when you look at recent urban developments, this is a Shanghai street 30 years ago, bicycles everywhere. Now you have traffic jams everywhere. And in several places, the bicycles have been forbidden to not disturb the flow of the automobile. Uh, whereas in Copenhagen, um, we're expanding our bicycle lanes. Uh, recently, they counted that 37% of the Copenhageners commute by bike. We have the city bike, this system of free bicycles that you can use if you visit the city. So we thought, like, why don't we relaunch the bicycle, like remind the Chinese of what they were so good at 30 years ago, uh, namely like how fun it is to ride a bicycle through the city. So we conceived of the Danish pavilion as a, as a loop of a Danish urban condition complete with the blue bicycle lanes and, uh, and the city bikes. Um, so you can actually bicycle through the, uh, through the exhibition itself out on the roof, um, like practice what you preach, basically. Um, and also, like, uh, both Shanghai and Copenhagen are port cities. But another example is in Copenhagen, our harbor water has become so clean that you can swim in it. One of our first designs was the design for the Copenhagen harbor bath that extends public life into the water. So instead of commuting like two hours by bus or train, you can actually just jump in the port in the middle of the city. Um, so again, we thought, like, um, instead of talking about it, why don't we allow the visitors to experience uh, how clean, if not how cold, the Danish harbor water is? So we made a harbor bath in the middle of the, uh, of the pavilion. Serves as a view for the meeting rooms in the basement. Um, and in the middle of this like, uh, harbor bath, we proposed to, to place uh, uh, the little mermaid. Uh, not a copy of the mermaid, but the actual mermaid. Uh, would go to China for, uh, for six months, so the Chinese could, that sort of grew up with the story of the mermaid could experience her in real life. Actually, when we, when we announced this in, uh, in Denmark that we were going to move the mermaid, the, the Danish equivalent of the Tea Party uh, tried to pass a law specifically against moving the mermaid. Uh, and actually, sort of, uh, for the first time in my life, I was invited to speak at the parliament arguing uh, her case. Uh, and as you can see, we, we got her. Uh, Chinese customs. 
Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and there she is. Um, actually, in, in her place, uh, we invited the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei uh, to make a, an art installation. And he, uh, he installed a security camera in the pavilion uh, that sort of monitors the, the, the mermaid. And the, the, the tourists who would go in vain in Denmark would actually see that she was, uh, she was OK on the other side of the, of the, of the world. But sort of speaking, not, not only did we attempt to sort of consolidate all the elements of, uh, of Danish city life that are examples of how a sustainable city can actually increase the, uh, the quality of life, we also wanted the, the, the pavilion to operate sustainably. And um, one of the main culprits of energy consumption for buildings in a climate like the, uh, the one in Shanghai is uh, air conditioning. So we thought, like, uh, what if we can actually exploit the fact but because of the geometry of the building, as hot air rises, it follows the underside of the, of the ceiling. And because of the rotation, it is moved towards the facade. So if the facade is perforated, uh, we can actually uh, uh, create a breeze that will then take water in from the main entrance. And this is where we have the pool. And because of the phenomena called evaporative cooling, um, when, uh, when water vaporizes, it uh, consumes energy and temperature we actually get a, a cool, naturally cool air uh, through, the, through the building. All we have to do is perforate the facade uh, evenly. But because the, the facade is also structural, it's built like a ship construction. Um, uh, Arab calculated, you know, like, for instance, like when, the, when the building takes off from the ground, uh, there's a, a big bending moment. This is a diagram showing the forces uh, uh, in the steel. Uh, so they basically said, you know, in those places, we weren't allowed to perforate as much. So as a result, we get this sort of uh, almost like an ornament that is created uh, by the forces uh, that flow through the, the building itself. So you're not only allowed to see people and bicycles moving inside the, uh, the building, but also the flow of forces uh, through the steel of it. And as a result, the entire exhibition space is, uh, is naturally ventilated. Um, it could also use, be used for like a, getting a snapshot without queuing. Um, so as a sort of a litmus test, you can say like our idea was to show how sustainable life could be more fun than, no, uh, than normal life. Uh, this is the first image we published of the pavilion uh, when we won the competition to design it. And if you sort of notice the red rectangle, uh, this is one of the first images published of Iron Man 2 showing Tony Stark's Mad Science Expo. Uh, and if you look at the, the smaller red rectangle, if, if you compare the two, it's uh, Hollywood uh, on the left and uh, Shanghai on the right. So first we thought like, you know, this is big business, and you know it's the land of litigation. We should sue them and get rich. Um, but then we remember that uh, um, Coco Chanel said that copying is the highest form of compliment. So if, if Hollywood starts ripping off sustainable architecture to show science fiction, it could be a, a sign that we're moving towards uh, hedonistic uh, sustainability. As a sort of final souvenir from the pavilion, uh, we made this small video that shows that not only is the pavilion uh, you know, uh, 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 embodying hedonistic sustainability. It's also the perfect museum for impatient people, because you can actually bicycle through the entire exhibition out on the roof and back out again without missing anything in just uh, two minutes.
That was sort of our first take on hedonistic sustainability, trying to sort of show elements of how sustainable cities could uh, increase life quality. Um, another sort of uh, set of examples is um, uh, a series of investigations for, uh, for projects we've been doing in, in, in Copenhagen. Um, the, the building on the left is actually where I have my own apartment, uh, but I'd like to talk about the building on the right. Um, we were basically asked to design uh, an apartment building next to a big parking structure. And we thought instead of having like a traditional stack of apartments looking at a big boring block of cars, why not transform all the apartments into penthouses, put them on a podium of, uh, of vehicles. <coughs> Since Copenhagen is completely flat, if you want to have a nice south facing slope with a view, you have to do it yourself. Um, then we sort of uh, chopped up uh, the volume so we wouldn't block the view from my apartment. Um, <laughs> and then basically what happens is that the cars, they occupy all the deep space on the ground. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the apartments, they are located uh, facing south with beautiful views. And actually combining all of the splendors of a suburban lifestyle, like a house with a garden, but in a dense urban context and, uh, and with a penthouse view. So, um, so there you see the sort of the, the mountain of homes. Uh, there's a single diagonal elevator that gives access to all the apartments. The parking, uh, because it's, uh, it's not sort of this claustrophobic space underground, it's, we can make it naturally ventilated, again, if we perforate the facade. And in this case, uh, we found out that we could actually uh, clad it with uh, aluminum plates with holes in six different sizes, paying only a 5% premium. Uh, and because the holes look dark on the bright background of the aluminum, uh, we contacted a Himalaya photographer that uh, gave us this uh, giant rasterized uh, portrait of, uh, of Mount Everest that essentially transforms the entire urban facade of the building into a giant urban artwork for free that at the same time allows the, the building to breathe. Um, back in the apartments, you get this sort of south-facing urban oasis where the wood floor of the apartments continue outside as the terrace and as the facades. And uh, all the rainwater that drops on the mountain is accumulated in a big water tank. And there's an irrigation system so that uh, in dry periods, we can ensure that gradually the mountain will turn into this sort of inhabited Cambodian temple ruin completely covered in, uh, in greenery. Um, so the mountain was essentially our first example of what we call architectural alchemy, that you can create, if not gold, then at least added value by mixing traditional ingredients. You create like a, a naturally ventilated parking, and all of the apartments get the optimum possibilities for uh, harvesting uh, uh, passive solar heat gain, which is a, a bonus in, in Denmark. We took this same idea one step further uh, for another project in Copenhagen, at the, right at the edge of the city limits of this new neighborhood. We were asked to do a, a big urban block. And the big question is, when you build a new uh, neighborhood from scratch, how do you give it the diversity and the liveliness of a historical city? Well, typically what you do in, uh, in Denmark these days is that you do a lot of identical apartments, and then you put on different facades to create this sort of cosmetic illusion of diversity. Um, but what about real diversity? What about the fact that shops and offices, they like to be close to the customers, so we put them on the ground? Uh, residential uh, programs goes on top, but because residential space is less deep than commercial space, we get space for a little garden in front and maybe you know, a path allowing kids to run over and play with their neighbors. Then we add a layer of more classic apartments and then sort of penthouse row houses with front lawns and, and roof gardens. So now we created this stack where each typology occupies its favorite position in the mix. Uh, the master plan dictates a pedestrian shortcut, so we turn it into a figure eight. Uh, creating a, an urban square that connects through the building. And then finally, uh, commercial spaces, they like uh, daylight, but they spend energy on cooling and they don't like glare. So uh, to minimize thermal exposure, we suppress them to the south and lift them up to become a, a four-story office building to the north, but at the same time lifting all the uh, apartments up into the sun and the view. And in reverse, in the southwest corner, we open up the entire courtyard uh, to enjoy the views of the, of the landscape and, uh, and the sun. <clears throat> so um, um, this is what it uh, ends up looking like. Um, you can see the, the, so the distortion. This is from the construction side. Um, the, the path in front of the townhouse is actually short circuits, and you get this sort of uh, possibility to, to walk all the way to the, to the penthouse. Um, we managed to start building right before the, uh, uh, the global financial crisis. Unfortunately, a lot of the neighbor buildings didn't get that far. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and also, like, it's, it's at the city limits, so you have this sort of clash of, uh, of different life forms. Um, uh, but we were kind of happy that we spent so much energy on trying to sort of intensify the urban diversity within the volume, 
Because this sort of idea of architectural alchemy doesn't only allow us to optimize uh, the sort of the local conditions uh, for each of the different programs. Uh, it also, uh, in this case, allows us to expand public space, the possibility for spontaneous social encounters that is normally restricted to occurring on the ground floor or the street level, in this case is actually invited to invade the, the urban block uh, uh, all the way to the penthouse and back down again. So you can actually sort of uh, walk or bicycle uh, all the way to the, uh, to the penthouse. So, so rather than being this sort of two-dimensional facade or even a three-dimensional architectural object, it becomes a, a three-dimensional urban condition that actually provides spaces for social life uh, at, at all levels uh, within the city. Um, so it's, uh, it's currently sort of uh, approaching completion. Uh, each garden uh, for the townhouses has a tree, so that in six years you'll actually have this sort of lane of 150 trees uh, grown to uh, six meters uh, all the way up. It's sort of a, almost like African savanna of Copenhagen with, uh, with wildebeest. Um. <laughs> and there's this sort of general sort of symbiotic attitude that you know, the facades of the offices become the handrails of the, of the path. The handrail of the path becomes the lighting. So everything is sort of uh, attempted to be integrated uh, and sort of <clears throat> symbiotic. So, so you could say that this is like just ideas that would work in a sort of Scandinavian context. Um, but uh, like almost a year ago, we were approached by uh, a New York-based developer called uh, Durst Fetner Residential to look at a site uh, on the west side of, uh, uh, of Manhattan. And as you can see, Manhattan has been going through this amazing uh, process of like creating the Hudson River Park, the High Line, a former train uh, track turned into a park, the, the plan to, uh, that over the last three years they've made more bicycle lanes than uh, exist in the entire city of Copenhagen. Um, so we thought, like, what about continuing this sort of um, uh, 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 process of making Manhattan more uh, inhabitable? Um, and sort of this is the site on the, on the west side, uh, the Hudson River Park. Um, uh, and, uh, and the bicycle lanes uh, that sort of uh, circumvent all of, uh, of Manhattan. This is what housing looks like uh, currently on the place. And we thought, like, now we spent almost 10 years trying to uh, escape the tyranny of the typology of the Copenhagen courtyard. So now that we have the chance to do something else, we thought, like, why not actually do a courtyard building in, uh, uh, in Manhattan? Because, uh, like, you can say, like, at an architectural scale, um, the courtyard is what Central Park is at an urban scale, like an urban oasis. Uh, at the heart of uh, uh, urban density. So the big question is like, how do you combine an American skyscraper with density and views with the sort of social potential of a courtyard? So essentially we, we placed uh, a courtyard building uh, uh, on the site, elevated it to uh, leave space for uh, public amenities on the ground floor. And then we sort of stretched the northeast corner to uh, 450 feet, uh, creating this sort of almost like a warped uh, uh, a courtyard building where you can say, like, traditionally, the courtyard is some like, secret element uh, that is only visible uh, for, the, for the tenants or uh, from Google Earth. But in this case, it actually becomes a major element in the facade of the building. Uh, and as you can see the, from the Hudson River Park, you can see that this sort of rejuvenation process is actually continuing within the urban city fabric of, uh, uh, of Manhattan. Um, also, this sort of uh, the, the warped plane that goes from vertical to almost horizontal. Uh, also brings light to the, to the street. Um, and all of the apartments are turned towards the, the water in this sort of fishbone-like structure, which creates this uh, like, uh, sort of a texture on the, on the facade. And then from the east, it almost looks like this sort of a spire. Uh, and finally, the, the apartments uh, with the balconies and, uh, and the courtyard with, with views over uh, the Hudson River. The courtyard actually goes from 42 inches to uh, 450 feet and back down again. So essentially, like almost like a, a Copenhagen typology, uh, sort of married to uh, a sort of an American uh, classic, um, because it's going to be a quite significant part of the West Side waterfront. We made this little short view, saying like what it might be like in the future, traveling up and down the the highway.
um, uh, and, and and this project is it's it's in the process right now. We are uh, we've been uh, working for like the last nine months with the Department of City Planning, uh, and we are like now in the process of the of the public uh, uh, process with the with the with the community. Um, but it, but it seems like this might be a, a very likely uh, future uh, tenant on the west side of uh, of Manhattan skyline. Um, the the last sort of uh, project that I would like to sort of um, explain is um. It's, it's a small fragment of this uh, this big project called the Loop City, which is by far the, the greatest undertaking we've been uh, involved in so far. Uh, it's uh, we've been hired by the ten municipalities of metropolitan Copenhagen uh, to look at a at a, a future urban vision for for Copenhagen, looking at the, the creation of this new um, loop line for for the train system. And the main uh, proposal is to um, essentially uh, Copenhagen and Sweden are already connected with this bridge. To propose a new two-mile bridge and create a single loop that com that uh, connects all of the densest areas of, of Scandinavia, um, uh, it will create a, a, a loop of public transportation and highways that will mean that no place within the loop city is going to be further away than 40 minutes, and also it becomes a, a smart grid, uh, exchanging uh, the primary sort of hydroelectricity of Sweden with the uh, uh, wind power of uh, uh, of Denmark. It also connects some of the, 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 the sort of most industrious uh, uh, businesses in, uh, in the region. Um, and, uh, and the main idea is sort of uh, over time and through this sort of a uh, master plan to fuse uh, uh, sort of eastern Denmark and southern Sweden into this binational metropolitan region uh, that also introduces uh, purple for the first time in a flag. Um, and it's, it actually has exactly the same size as the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and both in terms of its uh, demographics and its uh, sort of uh, affluence, it's, it's two quite similar uh, uh, regions. Um, and part of the master plan, we're looking at how this uh, new train line can be integrated with you know, uh, strategic identifications next to the sta stations, that it also becomes like this big power grid that could be used uh, as a central infrastructure for uh, uh, charging stations, for, um, for better places, electric cars. Um, um, also, like uh, the, the, sh the heavy showers uh, caused by global warming, uh, we're making these reservoirs in the form of uh, uh, beautiful lakes uh, uh, that can sort of sustain the, the heavy showers that we've been experiencing. And then one of the ideas was that since we're fusing uh, industry and, uh, and places for working and, and living, uh, what if we could sort of explore uh, symbiotic relationships like the excess heat from the industrial production could be used, for instance, for thermal baths or other social programs? And these ideas might sound like science fiction, but uh, actually we, uh, we just uh, won a competition in, uh, in Copenhagen for, for a project that is located within the Loop City uh, for a waste to energy plant. Because uh, in Denmark, we, um, we only landfill 4% of our waste. 42% uh, is recycled, and 54% is used as fuel for the production of electricity and heat. Uh, in Copenhagen, 97% of the homes actually have district heating, which is excess heat from the power production. So no, no energy is spent for heating the homes. It's, uh, it's uh, sort of existing heat that is being tapped and used for the, uh, for the homes. So you can say the citizens of Copenhagen form an ecosystem with this uh, waste to energy plant. Um, and this is what they look like. It's these big, ugly factories that sort of uh, block the views and cast shadows on the neighbors. Uh, this is the existing uh, facility. And, and the task of the competition was to design it so that it actually could actually sit nicely in the city. It's two miles away from the city hall. This is the director of the, of the existing facility and the new facility. And she says, it's important that the waste to energy plant is integrated into the environment. The architecture should be a gift to the city. So we thought, like, it's also going to be the tallest and the biggest building in all of Copenhagen. Uh, and we thought that instead of just merely gift wrapping it to make it look nice, um, what about actually finding out if it could sort of um, uh, contribute to the city. It's going to be located there. This is uh, it's going to be as tall as as these chimneys. This is the opera. This is the royal theater. Uh, and out there, like uh, in the port, you you already have a go kart track. Uh, you have a marina right next to the the factory. Uh, and uh, like right in front of the factory, you have Copenhagen cable track, where uh, water skiers can actually be pulled around on the water. Um, uh, in this sort of uh, infinity loop of uh, of skiing. Um, so speaking of skiing, Copenhageners, they actually uh, happily, because like, Copenhagen is completely flat, Denmark is completely flat, uh, we happily go eight hours by bus to go to Isabel in the south of Sweden, where you have a 150 meter tall hill. Um, 
our factory alone is 100 meters tall. Uh, so uh, we thought, you know, Denmark might not have mountains, uh, but we have mountains of trash. Uh, and uh, Copenhagen actually has uh, the climate, but not the topography for alpine skiing. So what if we simply put uh, Isabel uh, on the roof of the factory? Um, we already know how big the machines are. So we uh, create the sort of minimum envelope. Uh, we embed the, the chimney. We create spaces for uh, uh, the staff um, on with the, the slopes. So uh, uh, an elevator brings people uh, 350 feet up in the air. Uh, and from here, they can actually choose between a green, a blue, and a black slope. And because it's man-made, we can engineer it so it actually returns uh, in the same place. Um, so uh, we even have like a, a facility for the kids, uh, uh, ice skating rink, some cross-country skiing. Um, and uh, the, the roof surface is, is made with this Italian product that's like a, a, a very slippy uh, sort of astroturf with some padding, which actually allows you to uh, ski with normal skiing equipment, even in the summer. So you have this sort of nice hybrid of bikini skiing. Um, but in the winter, we actually have four months with snow, or at least uh, night frost. So just by uh, uh, blowing vapor into the air at night, you can actually have, uh, have snow. Um, so, um, so we sort of suggested also they wanted, uh, they wanted a visitor center. And that would typically be a place where school teachers would drag the kids uh, once in their lifetime to, to see how uh, trash is turning into heat and energy. We thought, like, what about actually turning it into a destination, a place where people would go uh, 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 sort of on their own uh, energy? And then suddenly they would discover that there was interesting stuff happening inside the ski slope. Um, for the facade, we made it out of these big planters uh, that drains the water from the roof uh, and, and waters the plants automatically. And that also, in the summer, filters the light into the, the factory that becomes this nice, naturally ventilated workspace. Um, at night, you'll see the machines inside. So you can see like the slide I was opening with, this idea of trying to sort of uh, engineer all the different processes of, uh, of society into a single ecosystem is almost getting realized with this project. <clears throat> As um, not only locally uh, does the, you know, the chimney effect of the, of the large space of the factory, the natural filtration of the light, uh, the drainage of the water through the plants, the local uh, recycling of both heat and water, but also, and more importantly, the big ecosystem that the factory creates with uh, the city. Um, and as a sort of final element, um, um, you can say, like, not only is this uh, facility sort of economically and ecologically sustainable in the sense that it transforms, it recycles waste and transforms most of it into heat and energy, but it's also socially sustainable because instead of like occupying a, a major part of the city with a big factory, it actually becomes a a, 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 a gift to the, to the citizens of Copenhagen and actually creates a social activity that would otherwise be, uh, be impossible. <clears throat> the, the last element, of course, is the chimney. And uh, the, this uh, facility uses, it deploys like all the latest technology. It controls the, the gases inside the oven and the temperatures. It has the best filter technology. So the smoke coming out will be incredibly clean. It won't be toxic, but it will contain CO2. Um, so. Um, the chimney, uh, we propose to design it as a disk that also forms the roof of this sort of panoramic arrival pavilion uh, on the top. And what happens is that as, the, um, as the, this disk fills up with CO2, it expands this chamber. And when there is one ton of CO2, it compresses, and then it blows a, a giant smoke ring. Uh, so uh, I mean, of, of course, on one hand, we sort of like this idea to uh, we, we like the idea of sort of taking the, the symbol of the problem, pollution, and turn it into something playful. Also, because like the, the smoke is uh, non-toxic. But I think more, more importantly, um, you can say like, um, I, so at night we were thinking that you could sort of like play a little bit with, uh, with the smoke ring. But more importantly, uh, one of the main drivers of behavioral change is knowledge. If people don't know, they can't act. Uh, and you know, when, when I was a kid and there was like a lightning flashing, uh, my parents would say that every time I would count to three, the, the lightning would be uh, one kilometer away until I heard the bang. Uh, you know, in the future, when, you, when you're confused and kids ask, you know, what is one ton of CO2, you can say, like, each smoke ring is one ton of CO2. And if, you know, suddenly the smoke rings start coming more frequently, there's something rotten at the, at the waste to energy plant. Um, also, it could be a nice symbol for the, for the loop CD, this sort of uh, sustainable region in uh, uh, in Scandinavia. 
So um, you say like the the, the sort of the idea of this talk uh, was, uh, was was the notion of, uh, of of hedonistic sustainability, trying to have like an optim optimistic and even opportunistic approach to sustainability. You can also say um, hedonistic sustainability is almost like a contradiction in terms, on oxymoron that. Normally, you would say that hedonism and sustainability are sort of uh, mutually exclusive. Um, we, uh, we recently did a, a, a comic book about architecture called Yes is More, which was like a, a manifesto for this sort of inclusive approach to architecture, trying to say yes to as many uh, different things as possible and, and fuse it into symbiotic hybrids. We were considering to call the book, um, so it's, it's generally sort of shows this sort of typical either or kind of approach that. Whenever you apply rational thinking to a problem or a condition, you start dissecting the condition into its constituent parts, and they quite often materialize into silos of separate thinking. A typical example is um, uh, sort of modernistic uh, town planning that you say housing goes into residential suburbs, uh, offices goes into uh, corporate city cores or brain parks, shopping goes into shopping malls. And in that way, you sort of create dead neighborhoods with no possibility for, for synthesis. So rather than either, either or, we're proposing this sort of idea of bigamy, uh, that you can actually have both. It might be, uh, it might be problematic in, in romantic situations, but in, in urbanism, actually to uh, explore the overlaps uh, is, is, is way more interesting. And as a sort of a statement for like a, an architectural agenda, um, we believe that you know, turning um, the, sort of the, the vision of a, a sort of a economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable city uh, into a, a, a sort of a pragmatic utopian master plan uh, for the future. Thank you.